what is difficult extubation? We are too much scared to remove the endotracheal tube. And extubation failure means it is the inability of the patient to maintain the patent airway and effective spontaneous ventilation after removal of the endotracheal tube, purposeful removal of the endotracheal tube. That is extubation failure. And is it really that difficult? Just removing the tube is that difficult? So let me share a few of my experiences with you. A young male with a CA buccal mucosa, a command operation was planned. We have done a planned fiber optic intubation because intubation was difficult. And extubation was also planned. Extubation was planned on the next day. So after meeting all the criteria of extubation, patient is conscious, well-oriented, doing everything is fine. So extubated. But immediately after 15-20 minutes, there was a call from the ICU that patient is not well. When we go there, patient was in a restless phase, unable to talk and started desaturation. He could not able to talk well. So immediately we called for help to the surgeon. Meanwhile, patient arrested. There was a bradycardia and arrest. We have given, we have started CPR, given three doses of adrenaline. Meanwhile, surgeon done the surgical cricothorotomy. And immediately after that, patient recovered. Within few seconds, patients became all right. And the further course is normal and patient went home fine. That was really a very narrow escape. And in the second case, it was an 81-year-old lady having diabetes and hypertension for MRM. Everything was normal. All investigations, airway, everything is normal. 2D echo was normal. So routine case was done under general anesthesia. Routine extubation was done. But after extubation, patient went into laryngospasm and started desaturation. So we immediately done the mask ventilation. So it was so prolonged. So we have inserted the LMA. There was a pink frothy sputum coming out of the LMA. So we have intubated. We know that there was a frank pulmonary edema was developed and shifted to the ICU. There we have done a 2D echo and we found that the ejection fraction was reduced from 60% to 40%. So we have managed accordingly the management of the poor LV and pulmonary edema. And meanwhile, Patients settled over a period of time after three, four hours, four, five hours, and then we have extubated the patients. So the incidence of extubation failure is not less. And the Difficult Airway Society, the Royal College of Anesthetists, the National Audit Project, they have surveyed what is the actual problem of extubation related problem. And they found that Amongst all the airway complications which happen in perioperative period, one third is because of the extubation. That is big number. And to that of most common cause is upper airway obstruction because of the laryngospasm or the airway edema. And the most important finding which I uh, really feel that it is because of the poor anticipation and poor planning of the extubation. The problem is really big. It is around 0.1 to 0.45%, which is the extubation failure. And amongst that, around 10% leads to mortality. And a data from American Society of Anesthesiologists say that around 18% of the insurance claim about the death in a perioperative period related to the difficult airway, which is occurring because of the extubation. Why this is happening? Because we are always more concerned about the intubation. There are always uh, CMEs and workshops are going about the difficult intubation, how to perform intubation. And we are giving very less concentration on the extubation as we are too much focused on the takeoff, but we are very much less concerned about the landing. But for the safe journey, the both are important. The safe way for the safe anesthesia, both are equally important. So for that, to reduce the complications related to the extubation, the All India Difficult Airway Association laid the guidelines on how to extubate a difficult intubated patients. And Difficult Airway Society also laid the guidelines about the how to extubate in general. So we are more focused today on the All India Difficult Airway Association guidelines and we'll see uh, one by one. This is the guidelines. There are three limbs in these guidelines. One is in a normal airway, how to perform extubation. In the second limb, there is a pre-existing difficult airway that is difficult mask ventilation, difficult intubation. And in limb three, the airway became complicated during surgery and anesthesia because of the procedure. And we'll see this one by one. We'll see limb two first because we are too much concerned about this, that the patient is having already having a difficult airway. We know that in, there are a plethora of patients which came to us having a difficult mask ventilation, difficult intubation, 
and in that way so how to extubate such patients because we have done too much zigglery to intubate such patients we have at keep our attention a lot to intubate but how to extubate these patients so the first and foremost uh, need is to we have to keep the difficult airway cart ready we'll see this one by one then we have to fulfill all the extubation criteria if required we have to optimize the patient and then extubate the patient over the airway exchange catheter or boogie or for fiber optic bronchoscope and then after extubation we have to monitor the patient and oxygenation well so let us see one by one so we have to keep the, all airway related gadgets ready before extubation before we proceed to the okay. extubation of and most important amongst that is the airway exchange catheter cricothoracotomy device and the emergency cricothoracotomy set should be kept ready before extubation then all the extubation criteria to be fulfilled before extubation that is patient should be awake follow commands hemodynamic is stable all the respiratory parameters should be within normal limit reflexes and patient should be completely reversed from the neuromuscular blocking agents and if needed we have to optimize the patient that is lung recruitment if inadequate reversal is there we have to reverse it nowadays sugamadex is came so complete reversal is needed before extubation and after optimization after meeting all the criteria and keeping the airway cart ready then we have to extubate the patient over the airway exchange catheter or bougie so what is this airway exchange catheter this is a hollow catheter like a bougie bougie is not a hollow it is a solid structure but this is airway exchange catheter is a hollow which is having opening two three openings in the distally and proximally there is arrangement of attachment of the two types of connector one is for the bag mask ventilation and another for the jet ventilation and there are various sizes scheme as per the need of the patient sizes with the diameter and the length and at whenever we want to extubate the patient put the this airway exchange catheter through the endotracheal tube then up to 20 to 30 cm mark then slide out the endotracheal tube over it and keep this airway exchange catheter inside the oral cavity and fix it like this so what is the advantage of this so whenever you want you can reintubate but another most important advantage is that whenever a patient is having some desaturation you feel that patient is not doing fine but not reintubation is not immediately needed we can oxygenate that patient you can ventilate you can do the jet ventilation if required for some period of time before extubation you can avoid the reintubation immediate reintubation and what observation that one of the observation is the first attempt reintubation chances is around 87% when we use the airway exchange catheter then only 14% reintubation first attempt reintubation chances when we don't use airway exchange catheter this is a huge difference and how to perform this we have to insert the airway exchange catheter this is actually bulgy and uh, Keeping or uh, sliding in the uh, airway exchange catheter and sliding out the endotracheal tube, we have to extubate the patient, and we have to keep this airway exchange catheter or bougie there only, and we have to fix in this way. So we have to fix at around twenty-five to thirty centimeter as per the height of the patient, and we can keep this airway exchange catheter or bougie for two to twenty-four hours. So whenever we required, we feel that the patient is now okay for the extubation, we can. remove the tube also so airway exchange catheter may not be available everywhere so you can use the bougie and that is available everywhere but what is the basic difference between the bougie and airway exchange catheter is that so whenever you feel that there is a ventilation is not doing fine there is inadequate ventilation is going on you can always ventilate through the airway exchange catheter or you can oxygen insufflate or you can give cpap but for the oxygenation we have to rely on the via the face mask or nasal cannula and whenever you feel that there is inadequacy you can jet ventilate it but in airway exchange catheter but whenever there is inadequate ventilation we have to reintubate immediately so some margin or uh, buffer is there when airway exchange catheter uh, when we use airway exchange catheter but because of the unavailability you can use bougie also somebody may put the igel or lma over the airway exchange catheter or the bougie for some period of time this is called as hybrid technique or some may extubate over the fiber optic bronchoscope and keeping the bronchoscope there at the place but there are chances of damage to the 
fiber optic bronchoscope or you cannot keep the fiber optic bronchoscope for a long period of time. But advantage is that you can visualize the, the airway with the fiber optic bronchoscope. Now we'll see the second limb, the third limb. That is airway became complicated during the surgery because of the airway edema or collapse or there are surgery around the trachea which causes the compromise to the airway. So airway edema is developed because of the trauma, because of the intubation or because of the surgery. So whenever there is an unanticipated intubation is there, we do a lot of jugglers to intubate, loss of trauma, a lot of force uh, is there or even a tight fitting tube for a prolonged period of time can cause airway edema. Even a cuffing on a tube, a few anesthetists are having a practice of giving less relaxant and that causes continuously cuffing over the tube. That itself is very hazardous and causes airway edema. Continuously head and neck movement during the surgery should be ordered because that may also cause uh, airway edema. And there are various classes. It is classified into supraglottic, glottic and infraglottic. That is, it is supraglottic means it is an epiglottic edema or aritonoidal edema, retroaritonoidal. And why this difference is needed? Because for the treatment of this edema, we have to give the steroids and adrenaline nebulization. And for the nebulization, for the supraglottic and glottic edema, we have to keep an another endotracheal tube behind the, the endotracheal tube in C2 to nebulize with the adrenaline to reduce the edema over it. Because when we give the nebulization with the in C2 endotracheal tube, only the subglottic edema is been covered with this. And how much adrenaline use? We have to use one ampoule of adrenaline, one or two ampoule, and it's diluted up to four to five ml of normal saline. And then nebulization is given. And second way is the tracheomalacia because of the airway collapse. Because tracheomalacia or airway collapse doesn't happen because of the handling, but because of the erosion or softening of the uh, tracheal rings because of the adjacent structure, compression or erosion over it. Usually the long-standing thyroid or tumor which is compressing over the tracheal rings causes softening of the tracheal rings and when we extubate it there will be a collapse of that ring and some other causes is prolonged intubation or vascular malformation are also there and when you extubate this patient's patient will have inspiratory waves or inspiratory strider so it is better to use in a deep plane of extubate in a deep plane of anesthesia to avoid the cuffing over it in per, whenever there is a suspicion of the tracheomalacia so how to identify that this particular patient is is having a airway edema or collapse of the airway before extubation. So there are two tests. One is by the cuff lick test and second we can assess with the sonography. So what is this cuff lick test? We have to see the tidal volume change before and after the cuff deflation. And if the tidal volume change, if it is more than 25% or if it is more than 130 ml, that means there is no significant airway edema or collapse. And then you can extubate over the airway exchange catheter or bougie. But if there is no uh, leak is present, that means there is a substantial amount of the airway edema is there. So even or the collapse. So whenever you deflate the cuff, this edema or the collapse stuck up over the endotracheal tube and there will not be any leak. So if this leak test is absent, delay the extubation optimize the patient like the steroids, adrenaline and then extubate over the airway exchange catheter. And if collapse is there, just straightway delay the extubation and extubate whenever needed, extubate in a deep plane of anesthesia to avoid the cuffing because cuffing and airway irritability increases the airway collapse. And be ready for the reintubation or emergency front of neck axis. And the role of sonography is huge in managing such difficult airway extubation. So you can assess the airway edema, you can assess the collapse of the tracheal links, or you can assess the even a cricothyroid membrane distance, width, depth from the skin, if emergency cricothyroidomy is needed, and a lot many other things can be assessed with the sonography. And whenever you fail to reintubate, many times you may not intubate such patient, reintubate this patient. Either you have taken out the tube without a airway exchange catheter, or the airway exchange catheter accidentally came out, or you there are various ways that it became kinked or like that. You cannot able to reintubate this patient. That time it is very much needed to learn ourselves how to perform a various cricothyrotomies because emergency front of neck. Either we do the cricothyrotomy or emergency tracheostomy, but if, if this tracheostomy is mainly for the surgeons. So we should know how to perform the various cricothyrotomies, needle, 
or cannula cricothorotomy, open surgical or percutaneous cricothorotomy. So this is in short about the anatomy. So this is a thyroid cartilage. This is a cricoid and in between there is a cricothyroid ligament. In such, there is a big chapter or big discussion will be there, should be there on the special cricothyrotomy. But in short, I will explain this various cricothyrotomies. And this cricothyrotomy membrane is around uh, 1.5 to 2 centimeter in adults. And in children, it is a smaller size. And on either side, there are muscular strips, muscular strips are there. But below that, there is directly the cricothyroid membrane is there. So surgeons perform the tracheostomy here on the second, third uh, ring, but emergency cricothyroid is done over here at point A in between the thyroid and cricoid. So such types of needle cricothyroid set, we have to keep ready. This we can perform manually, uh, mis uh, made manually. That is a 14 or 18 number cannula or you can is attached to the three number endotracheal tube connector and this is kept ready. Or you can have another set. This cannula is attached to 3 ml series and then it is attached to the 7.5 endotracheal tube connector. Or you can have this cannula, then syringe and then 5.5 number endotracheal tube, this attachment. And all these, whatever you prepare should be kept ready because whenever you need it, you should take out immediately and put in the cricothyroid membrane. So one of our colleagues made this arrangement. She had kept this airway exchange catheter and this needle cricothyrotomy set just attached beside the uh, anesthesia machine. So how to perform? We have to first find out the where is the cricothyroid membrane with your non-dominant hand and uh, this saline field uh, syringe is attached to the cannula and this cannula is inserted into the cricothyroid membrane which is guided by the non-dominant fingers and which is 45 degree tilted towards the caudal side and it is punctured and once we puncture the cricothyroid membrane there will be a gas entered into the syringe once it is entered we just slide on the cannula over the needle and take out the cannula and attach the oxygen source to this needle this is how, how to perform you have to first palpate the cricothyroid membrane with your non-dominant hand and then with the 45 degree advance and we get the air bubbles inside the normal saline and different types of oxygen sources we can attach to this needle or cannula these are either from the this anesthesia machine 10 15 liters per minute oxygen source is attached for that we need an the upper airway uh, need to be open to prevent the air trapping but you can attach the three way in between ox this oxygen source and the needle or cannula and in between this three way is open and we can put the thumb or open, remove the thumb for the inflation and deflation or even we can attach the ambu bag to that and which will give some time or buy some time for the further management but it is better to use in a pediatric patients than the adults but if nothing is available you can use it because it is very handy and in pediatric patients one liter per minute per year of age auction uh, should be given Nowadays, we can get commercially available track uh, cannula cricothyrotomy set, which is having an internal diameter of around 4 millimeter of internal diameter. Because what we use 14 millimeter or uh, 16 millimeter uh, needle cricothyrotomy cannulas are there or needle is there, the internal diameter is very small, 1.2 to around 1.5 millimeter internal diameter is there. But here, the commercially available quick track having an internal diameter of 4 millimeter of mercury. The procedure is the same, but you can attach this attachment and you can directly ventilate this patient when you are needed. Not only action it, but you can ventilate very well with this quick track cricothyrotomy set. Now, the surgical cricothyrotomy. When you are needed, you can put the endotracheal tube directly through the cricothyroid membrane. And the instruments, what we need for this is very minimal. We need a scalpel or knife, a bougie and tube. Is that is needed. With the same procedure is the same. We have to palpate the cricothyroid membrane with the non-dominant hand. Take a vertical skill incision. We have to dissect the skin till uh, with the finger till we palpate the cricothyroid membrane. And take the horizontal incision, around half centimeter horizontal incision over the cricothyroid membrane. Don't take vertical incision because there are chances of cord damage. And through that incision, put, just forget the bleeding around it. 
and in that area there is not much blood vessels are there put the buji inside it till you feel the resistance and then over that buji endotracheal tube is passed then remove the tube and this endotracheal tube through this endotracheal tube you can ventilate routine ventilation around 6 to 7 number endotracheal tube can be inserted into the adult patients or you can put a 5 or 6 number tracheostomy tube you can slide over it and you can ventilate and nowadays a percutaneous cricothotomy sets are also available the procedure is very simple it's like a seldinger's technique we have to puncture the cricothyroid membrane with the needle and the saline with attached saline filled need syringe is there once we puncture the cricothyroid membrane slide the guide wire into the needle and then take out the needle and do the incision over the skin near the guide wire up to the cricothyroid membrane and slide over the cannula over it and then take out the dilator and cannula and fix it and now this is ready and you can do this within a minute this cricothyrotomy is uh, all these cricothyrotomies can be done within minutes and the company claims that this milker company claims that we can do this within 30 seconds and now we come to the limb one that is a patient with a normal airway now you may wonder ki, why the normal airway should have a difficult extubation but we have seen if you remember a uh, number second case the airway is normal but we have to intubate this so that is a extubation failure so there are two adverse effect of the extubation one is there is increased left ventricular afterload because of the hemodynamic response there is increased heart rate and blood pressure and second one is when we extubate we change the positive inspiratory pressure to the negative normal respiration and that will increase the afterward we'll see afterwards how it increases afterwards and second is the airway irritability we cuff the which causes the laryngospasm and there is a raised raised intracavity pressure that is intracranial pressure intraocular pressure and this cuff or laryngospasm may precipitates the left ventricular afterload which is already raised because of the hemodynamics so what is afterload that is a pressure on the left ventricular wall during the ejection and that pressure is because of the two pressures one is pressure inside the left ventricle and other is because of the pressure outside the left ventricle now pressure inside the left ventricle is because of the uh, is equivalent to the pressure inside the aorta that is mean arterial pressure or inside the aorta during the systole because aortic wall is open and whatever the pressure is inside the aorta is equal to the pressure inside the ventricle and left ventricle has to eject against that pressure inside the aorta so more is the aortic pressure or mean arterial pressure more with will be the left ventricular afterload is one thing and in the extubation there will be increase in the mean arterial pressure and increase in the left ventricular afterload second one is the pressure outside the left ventricle so when your patient is taking uh, on ipv mode the pressure outside is positive this which pushes the left ventricular wall towards the cavity that means which helps the left ventricular cavity to to eject so what is the next uh, transmural pressure inside pressure inside the left ventricle minus pressure outside the left ventricle and when patient is on ipv this reduces the transmural pressure see here suppose the airway pressure aortic pressure is 100 and in ip when patient is on ipv mode outside pressure is suppose 30 10 20 30 in when patient is having a positive pressure ventilation so the transmural pressure is 70 only 100 minus 30 is 70 so the afterload is only 30 but when we extubate such patient the positive pressure change into the negative pleural pressure pressure and that increases the transmural pressure that means the pressure inside the ventricle minus that is mean arti pressure minus the pleural pressure which is negative which turns to be a more positive pressure that is 130 pressure in this example so that increases the afterload and on the top of that whenever there is a airway edema or upper airway obstruction the patient tend to increase the to intrapleural pressure in an attempt to overcome the air, upper airway obstruction that increase in the intrapleural negativity it increases the afterload so the afterload increase is because of either there is increased blood pressure or heart rate because of the extubation response or because of the change from the positive to negative normal respiration which is precipitated by the upper airway obstruction and in some patients which is having 
so this causes increase in the left load but in poor lv patients we, this increase in the left ventricular afterload may cause a deleterious effect and left ventricular may fail and very interesting finding is that in patient is having coronary artery disease may show a decrease in a ejection fraction by 30 to 50% so and then patient leads to cardiorespiratory failure and leads to extubation failure so how to tackle this so we cannot do anything of this number to cause that means we are going to extubate and change from the positive pressure to negative pressure we cannot do to that but we can definitely manage this extubation pressure response and we can definitely prevent the laryngospasm so there are two methods of extubation in such patients one is awake extubation and second one is a deep extubation so in awake extubation we have to suppress the pressure response by various mechanisms and you know that very well that is a topical lignocaine by 10% or iv beta blocker or iv lignocaine or fentanyl or amifentanyl infusion or dexmedetomidine a few minutes before extubation and we maintaining the stable hemodynamics we extubate the patient or the deep extubation method is there so contraindications to the deep extubation when our patient is having a known difficult intubation or ventilation you should not extubate this patient in a deep plane and methods are there are two types of method one is simply remove the endotracheal tube and then put the lma and second method is a bailey's method that means put the lma behind the endotracheal tube and then take out the endotracheal tube. so here we have to put the lma first in situ and then inflate the cuff of the lma then remove the uh, endotracheal tube before that we have to do the thorough uh, suction and all and then we have to deflate the endotracheal tube take out the endotracheal tube after thorough suctioning and then attach this circuit to the lm and extubation over this lm will give the less pressure response a second one i have told you we have to avoid the laryngospasm to prevent this laryngospasm we have to maintain or we have to avoid the light pain of anesthesia so either extubate when patient is awake or deep because laryngospasm more common when patient is in light pain of anesthesia or it is precipitated by the secretions or blood or debris so there is a method called as artificial cuff technique where while taking out the tube we connect this circuit to the end of the endotracheal tube and squeeze out the back and put the suction inside the oral cavity so that whatever the blood or uh, secretions are there it is taken out from the oral cavity away from the vocal cord and it is taken into the suction because of the squeezing of the back there is a positive pressure created inside the thorax and this debris is pushed inside the oral cavity and in uh, injection lignocaine or 2 mg per kg can be given before extubation which is helpful to suppress the response and to prevent the laryngospasm also and even if with this laryngospasm happens you just have to put a tight fit a mask with 100% oxygen do the jaw thrust like a larsen maneuver and do some cp give some pp cpap to this and even if the laryngospasm is not resolved give a small amount of propofol around 2.25 or something like that and even if it is uh, not responding and there is a desaturation or you feel that there is a pressure response because of the co2 retention give a full dose of propofol give scolene and reintubate the patient and after extubation the monitoring is really very important uh, because uh, many times this complication doesn't happen immediately after extubation but after a few minutes or few hours after that so you have to monitor completely and the most important we have to document what we have done and we have to tell to the patient's relative that means counseling is really very important and the das algorithm is that which i have told you which maintain the how to do the overall extubation there are four steps they have to plan the extubation prepare the extubation perform the extubation post extubation care which we have already discussed there in a different fashion so we have for the extubation we have different plans for the different set of patients but the most important is that we have to plan plan and plan the extubation like a before the start of case review during the anesthesia in what way we have intubated and what is the hemodynamic status and according to that and before extubation also so there are various methods in low risk patients awake or deep or exchanging over the airway catheter or bogey depending upon the availability or hybrid technique or just postponing the case or like that 
So we have to plan the extubation. If you don't plan, we are probably planning to fail. So extubation failure is even though you feel it is rare, we must extubate the patient, every patient considering having a possibility of reintubation. Thank you.